firstly thank you professor sharma for accepting my invitation and for agreeing to do this uh, i've long i've long been a distant student of yours of sorts i've been reading your books and reading your articles uh, i've got a few books of yours over here lined up but of course we can't get into each each and every one of those yeah. right <laughs> uh, yeah. I, i suppose one thing that we can focus on today uh, is uh, this book which is quite quite a simple and a short book that you wrote yeah, yeah. islam yeah. for hindus and uh my first question would be professor what uh do you think is the importance of religious literacy in our times for both muslims and hindus and uh, for indians in general what is the importance of religious literacy and uh what uh, uh are, what is the potential and what are the uh, pitfalls common pitfalls that we can encounter or, or we risk we risk getting into when we engage in hindu muslim dialogue yeah well thanks okay. for inviting me uh the question of religious literacy is a very important one and i think we have to be very careful in making the pitch for religious literacy because the term can have two meanings it can mean the traditional study of one's own religion and it can mean the modern study of another religion and let me explain what i mean by the terms traditional and modern in pre-modern times there was a lot of studying of religion going on yeah there was religious mm-hmm. literacy but one specialized in one's own tradition and this was probably the natural outcome of the relative isolation the relative mm-hmm. isolation in which the religions flourished now with from the around the middle of the 19th century the tradition of studying religion in a different manner gained ground in the west the first kind of study is called the confessional study of religion the second kind of study is called the non confessional study of religion the first kind of study is aimed at deepening one's faith right the second kind of study is based or directed towards extending one's knowledge this is also called the academic study of religion this is a crucial point i sometimes the distinction is made as follows studying a religion or rather studying religion and studying about religion studying religion here would mean studying religion in the sense that a person says i got religion the person got faith and guided by that faith the person is studying religion but studying about religion is born out of a desire to acquire knowledge about that religion whether it leads to faith and all our secondary issues the, the primary goal it's 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 the it may be if even a foreseeable outcome right but it is not the intended outcome yeah? right okay so by religious literacy when i use that word i mean of the second kind mm-hmm. that is to say hindu should know more about islam and muslims and muslim should know more about hinduism and hindus right this has nothing to do with faith right 
This has to do with knowledge. If we go into a country, we might want to read up about the history of that country, about its geography, about its political system. Yeah? Yes. Because we are going to live there. We may never, never acquire its uh, citizenship. Right. <laughs> See what I'm saying? Yeah. One does not have to become a Hindu or have that in mind at all, or becoming a Muslim. One wants to know because we are fellow citizens. Yeah? Right. We are certainly fellow citizens of the globe, if not of a country. Right? Right. So we would like to know what others believe, what others think, and like to share what we think about these matters of life and death. So what I advocate is the academic study of religion or the non-confessional study of religion. Unfortunately, these two expressions leave me unsatisfied. When we call it the academic study of faith, it loses some of its color mm. in the sense when we say, oh, that is academic. Right. When we say non-confessional, we are using a negative definition. Right. Yeah, we are not studying it the way a person in the tradition studies it. Yes. But we are studying it to understand what makes somebody who the person is. Right. right. Okay. So this study for which we are still looking for the Mahatma Gandhi called it the friendly study of world religion. Mm. That is, you want to know more about a religion uh, with a slight positive bias in the sense that they are fellow human beings, they are fellow citizens. Let us know what they feel, what they believe, what they think of the larger issues of life, who we are, where have we come from, where are we going? So yes, I certainly advocate religious literacy in this sense. Right. And I, I think one uh, risk of getting involved in religious education yes. uh, or, you know, one connotation that gets attached with that is that uh, someone has an, some hidden agenda behind it. Very and, good. Right? Absolutely. And uh, how do we uh, be cautious about you know these yeah, yeah. inflections of that. Very, very good point. Actually, I was going to come to that myself. Right. The, the fear, as you said, is that a non-proselytizing study of religion is not possible. That any study of religion has some kind of a proselytizing agenda Overt or covert? This is the basic feeling in the mind of those who make this argument. Now, the point here is that this kind of study has already or is already being carried out in some parts of the world. We have a history of at least the past 70, 80 years, ever since the Second World War, after which this form of study really took off. Though it started earlier in the middle of the 19th century. We have departments of religious studies throughout North America, throughout Europe, in Australia and New Zealand. And I think in general, in what we like to call the West. Now, all one has to go is to sit in one of these classes and see what goes on. Yeah. Our problem is, especially if we are from the subcontinent, the Indian subcontinent, that the secular assumption is that this is not possible. 
the secularists fear that any teaching of religion is teaching of confession of religion. Mm. And the only way I can think of of dealing with this uh, criticism is to draw attention to the fact that we are not hypothesizing here that religion may be taught like this. Mm. They are actually being taught. If we are still skeptical, all we have to do is to look at the textbooks which are used in these courses and see if the chapter on Judaism tries to persuade you to become a Jew or the chapter on Christianity tries to persuade you to become a Christian or the chapter of Islam, likewise. This is just not the case. We are dealing with a living reality, not a hypothetical reality. Now, for instance, the most widely read book in courses on world religions, as they are called, is a book by Houston Smith. Right. I the think now it's called the, the, world, the Wisdom Traditions of the World. I don't know what its current title is. Yeah. Its original title was The Religions of Man. Hmm. I think it is The World's Religions now. Uh, the, the copy that I have, that is the title yes. on that. Right. Okay, very good. Now, the interesting thing is that, and he Professor Smith told this to me personally, and it's also in print, sure. that every follower of the religion he was talking about feels that Professor Smith is a follower of that religion. Right, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I also got that, that sense about him when I was uh, reading him or listening to, to his, some of his lectures online. I couldn't, you know, situate him in one particular tra tradition. It seems that yes. he belonged to multiple uh, when he was speaking about those traditions. Right. Absolutely true. Now, what does it show? This also takes care of another cri possible criticism that if you try to present a religion objectively, you will necessarily be critical of it. Right. So the first fear was that you will try to convert people. Now we have the opposite fear. Right. That you will not be you will not present the religion in its proper way. Yeah. Both are misplaced. Yes. Both fears are totally unfounded. And this is my last argument. If we are still skeptical, then let us have a textbook in which each religion is presented by a follower of that religion. I think you have a, a volume that, that has that does something similar. You are yes, the I tried to achieve I tried to achieve that result in a book entitled Our Religions. Yes. Yeah. Indeed. So I think as you said. The fears are there. They might even be widespread, you know, mm -hmm. but the fears are unfounded. And I think, of course, ignorance of religions is also, I think that is more dangerous than any of these other fears that we have. I'm in complete agreement with you on this right. point. Because the secular illusion is, <laughs> the, 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 the secular mistake, I don't want to use too strong a word, yeah? the, the secular misperception is that if you don't talk about religion and you keep it out of the public square, you will keep it out of people's minds. Right. And they will have a clean slate about religion. Mm -hmm. 
This is not the case. This is not human nature. The moment I hear the word Islam or Baha'i or Judaism, a picture of that tradition forms in my mind. There are certain associations which float to the surface of my imagination, right? right. It is not that nothing floats to the surface. Right. And because they are likely to be based on ignorance, they are even more damaging than Indeed. one would imagine. Right. So I mean, if we right. are... Yes. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, sorry. No, uh, I was just mentioning that I think a study of religion seems very logical, at least as a part of cultural studies, you know, the, the study of culture, the, the study of history. It seems vital to uh, you know, have a grasp of those traditions as well. And to entirely miss that, even from a purely secular or from a purely cultural point of view, seems uh, like a mistake. Yes, of course, now, uh, in the, uh, among the secular scholars, there is a tendency now to favor the word pluralism over secularism. And I think this, See, this verbal shift mm. or the, the growing preference I see uh, for using the word secular and plural together, or sometimes preferring the word plural, seems to indicate that they have realized that it is better that we recognize that there are different religions and people should know about them have some knowledge about them, then that they should have a blank slate about it. This may have something to do with Western civilization. So the enlightenment, which is in a sense the foundation, the intellectual foundation of modern civilization, had a pronounced anti-religious bias. We can call it a bias now, it may have been, there may have been sound reasons for this at the time. Right. Yeah. But what resulted from that was that there was a move away from religion to the extent of imagining that human nature itself could be freed from this dimension of life. Right. And this has proved mistaken. Mm with the re-emergence of religion. Ever since uh, the, uh, the Iranian revolution in the public sphere, which this, where, from, where, from where the secularists wanted to keep it out. Right. Indeed. Well, uh, I don't know to what extent this is true, but uh, one literary theorist, uh, Teddy Eagleton, who's a Marxist, of course. Uh, Teddy Eagleton uh, says in, uh, he, he's got one, uh, in one of his lectures at, at Yale, he mentions that uh, the consequence of keeping religion deliberately out of the secular space in, in the West has been that you've had to see a really poor and really um, intellectually uh, weak kind of understandings of, 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 of that dimension of life, of spirituality and religion. So the consequence has been that it has not actually helped us become more intelligent about those matters or about just more intelligent in general, but that it has led to the opposite effect. Yes, I think the void then it tends to be filled by some kind of extremism. Right. Right. It's when, when, it's when a certain dimension of your life is denied. Right. I mean, human beings are by nature religious in the sense that they ask the key questions of religion. Who are we? Where have we come from? Where are we going? Now the secular world assumed that it had provided answers to these questions. 
that we are physical socioeconomic beings. <laughs> Mm. And you know the attendant etiology and uh, uh, and the uh, and uh, eschatology, which goes with it. Right. But human beings have found that fundamentally unsatisfying. Mm. It's also worth reflecting on the extent to which. the rise of uh, nazism communism and similar movements could be traced to this denial of transcendence the potential for transcendence which human being sense and sometimes even crave transcending the situation they are in right right well i think much can be said about the consequences of the enlightenment uh you know a uh, uh, move of effectively throwing the baby out with the bath water when it got rid of religion it also then got rid of spirituality or the transcendent element of life and was in denial about that so i think much can indeed be said about that uh, but uh, if if we can uh, come to um if if you would like to say a bit more about that professor or we can uh, come to about what the kind of interfaith ethics that are required in the uh, present world and in and in the situation that we find ourselves in because we yeah. in, the, in the in the beginning i mean just just to uh, sum this up in the beginning we spoke that uh, there are these fears of conversion and then there's this fear of uh, uh, perversion being, yeah, <laughs> perversion right yeah. exactly so what could be the ideal middle ground over there what would it look like yeah let me back up a bit on this and uh, put that in a bit on hold because i want to follow up on what you just said right about the enlightenment uh, i have always felt that the enlightenment emphasized reason right over against superstition fine yeah but as you said in its eagerness to pursue this it created a binary of the rational mm. and the irrational and tried to fit the whole of human life into it that is apply this binary to everything mm. what was left out was something which we might call non rational this non rational was conflated with the irrational mm. now let us see what the difference between non rational and irrational is by recognizing that the boundary might be porous and even shifting no? right our family relationships the affection in the family between the members is it rational is it irrational i think properly it should be called non rational right friendships loyalty mm. our appreciation of art literature right. yeah so so by squeezing out the non rational by conflating it with the irrational since they wanted to stand by reason alone mm. that's where the trouble started yeah they press too narrow a grid on human life for analyzing it right. or organizing it yeah okay so now we come to your uh, other question about how to avoid these two extremes uh <clears throat> we meant discussed earlier about conversion and perversion there is a whole method of study in religion which is devoted to this phenomenology which is no phenomenology right 
the whole goal of that method is to present, say, for instance, how a Muslim understands his religion or what he takes it to be, he or she takes it to be, or a Jew or a Christian by bracketing one's own presuppositions or one's own motives, you might say, either of conversion or perversion. We do not want to believe, but we want to put ourselves in the believer's footsteps. Mm -hmm. To know and feel how the believer believes. Whether I believe or not is a personal matter. Right. When I adopt this method, I cannot become the believer because then I become the object of study. Mm. But I want to place myself in the situation of the believer to understand why he or she believes what he or she does or practices what he or she practices. And for a long time, this was the dominant method in the field of religious studies from around the post Second World War till fairly recently. Okay. Past two decades, there has been some uh, questioning of this stance as, as too sympathetic you know, mm -hmm. to the believer, as, as making the field less critical than it should be. But I think it was a very important step because what is authentic data in the study of religion? Not what we think right. Christianity is, what Christians think Christianity is. Right. I think th this method, to some extent, uh, we can find a parallel to that in the field of anthropology, in ethnography, because you have these definition, these distinction between what is etic and emic or you know, concepts or categories that are coming from within a culture and concepts that the researcher is bringing to it. So uh, do you think that's, that's true, that in anthropology we have yes, some space that for true. that? Right? Look at the, the differences of scale in the sense that anthropology deals with the study of small society, right. small scale society. And here we are dealing with fairly large entities. Right. <laughs> yeah. But yes, yeah. the urge is the same. Right. To know, to know, without yeah. any ulterior motive. Right. Yeah.